Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Form of Federations India webinar series. This is our final webinar in our series on federalism in India. And this webinar today is called The Changing Fiscal Federal Architecture of India. Uh, I would like to now introduce our host and discussant, Professor uh, from the India Institute of Public Administration, Professor Vian Alak. Thank you, John. Good evening, uh, good morning, and good afternoon. This, uh, I'm in fact thankful to the Forum of Federation for having invited me in this final webinar of this India webinar series that they've organized uh, on federalism. And this particular webinar is on the changing fiscal federal architecture of India. I'm delighted to be joined by Mr. Subhashan Gurg, who is uh, an economic policy strategist, is a writer, commentator, and author. Till recently, he was the finance secretary to the government of India. And prior to that, he was with the World Bank at Washington, DC as the executive director uh, looking after the India, Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Sri Lanka. And prior to that, he was uh, the principal finance secretary to the government of Rajasthan. So he has a mix of uh, both the insights of the state government as well as the federal government here in India. He has written extensively, as you can see uh, from his picture, uh, his Next book is going to come out that's on the $10 trillion dream, which Penguin, Penguin is bringing out. So I joined uh, John and welcome you here, uh, Mr. Subhashkar, for this for the show. Thank now, you, Mr. Alok. My pleasure. Now, before I start the conversations, uh, just a minute or two on uh, the Indian federal architecture. The Indian Federal Assembly in India is comprises a union government, a state government, about 28 states, then eight union territories, three of them are with legislatures, then five other UTs. The UTs with legislature means the sensitive matters, the power is there with the union government. The other matters are there with the union territory governments. Then down the line, uh, we have about quarter million rural local governments. They are at three rungs, the district panchayat, what we call it, the rural local governments, the block panchayats and the village panchayats. Then in the urban areas, we have about 5,000 odd municipalities. The article one of the constitution says, India that is Bharat shall be a union of states is not uh, really a federation of states, but it's a union of states. And we will ask questions why it is a union of states here in India. Now, given the uh, federal fiscal architecture here at India, the state government rely heavily on the transfer systems from the union government. As per the rough estimates, two third of the revenue the union government collects one third of the revenue, the state government collects. Whereas on the expenditure side, the state government spent two thirds and the union government about one third or so. This means that there's a vertical imbalance and the state government helps to rely quite a lot on the union government. So this is what roughly the uh, fiscal architecture, the federal architecture here at India. Now, I ask questions uh, to you, uh, uh, Mr. Gurg. Now, given this kind of situations, what made the Constituent Assembly here at India to construct the constitutions the way it was? What was the historical or the political reasons behind uh, this uh, constitutions, which many people say is very unitary in, in characters? So I think Alok, your uh, question is basically directed towards fiscal federalism architecture of the constitution, not the larger one. So, and as you would recall, um, uh, the Government of India Act 1935 had uh, 
crafted over the uh, many years of the British rule, a certain kind of fiscal federal arrangement was by that time, the provincial governments had also become uh, uh, substantial political entities um, uh, in India. And uh, the 1935 uh, Government of India Act architecture, which did divide certain taxes between the, uh, the, the federal government um, or, or in, the, in the states, it also had a provision for a, uh, for a commission to sort of do the transfer of uh, resources. It also had provisions relating to how uh, the borrowing powers would be constructed. So my sense is that much of the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the fiscal federal arrangements in the constitution, which was adopted in 1949 and enacted from 50, uh, flowed from that. There were some changes which were made uh, in, in terms of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the loans kind of arrangement and all, but by and large that was there. It suited in a way, uh, because the, uh, as you noted rightly, the uh, India is union of states, most of the expenditure responsibilities, most of the uh, jurisdiction for development and other works were in, were, were in the space of the state. And the built-in um, differential arrangements between the revenues and the expenditure needed to be corrected. And therefore it provided for a, uh, for a very nice uh, independent kind of arrangement for the, uh, for the finance commission. So I think by and large, it flowed from there, uh, uh, the 1935 act and uh, the, the needs of the country at that point of time. That's very interesting. The 1935 act, it called India as a federation of federations, whereas article one of the constitutions call India, that is the, that is Bharat shall be a union of states. So that was so federation in name. That was federation in name, but in character, it was actually unitary state. There was much smaller. So we recognized in the constitution, the fact that uh, we wanted central, strong center and therefore a union, but it flowed from the states. Uh, and that I think uh, truly represents the character of the Indian constitution. But I think uh, at that time, the Pakistan was created. So there was a fear perhaps in the minds of the people uh, there in the Constituent Assembly, that uh, there could be a provision of coming in, but not going out. So, so now That's coming fair. to the second question, uh, uh, Mr. Gur. Now we are here in the 75th years of, of independence, and the country is has moved from a low income economy to a middle income economy. There were a lot of changes so far at the political fronts at the political front. Uh, how this uh, fiscal federal architectures have changed over a period of time. So you have, I think, written on this extensively uh, that it has been changed uh, for the last about 70 years or so. So while uh, there has not been, um, uh, as far as my knowledge goes, any change in the letter of the arrangements, uh, but there's been tremendous change in its spirit and the working uh, over the years. So um, uh, in first, uh, let us say 20, 25 years of uh, the constitutional working in the country, the, uh, the uh, fiscal relations between the center and the states practically were conducted um, in the manner in which the constitution um, provided it and continuing with the practices which were prevalent even before, before the independence. So um, uh, they, uh, there was uh, at that time uh, an arrangement where literally every state's project name by name, one by one, used to get some sort of assistance from the government of India. Uh, it was a customized arrangement that for some project, let's say irrigation, you would get this much loan or this much grant, or some projects would get only grants like um, the, uh, the famine related and others, uh, and some would get um, uh, less proportion, some would get. So by um, uh, 1960, middle of 1960s, if I recall, uh, there were thousands of projects um, which were individually funded by, by the government. 
uh, and that was the government of India for the states. That was the arrangement continuum. Um, this, by the way, um, was implicitly being worked under a provision in the constitution, which is the article 282, which provides that the central government can provide uh, 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 finance or assistance for any subject uh, which is which may be in the state's domain uh, without having the uh, functional jurisdiction over that subject. Uh, and these projects were funded uh, largely under that arrangement. The loan powers were also used like this. And that was the age of the planning age where um, the, uh, the, the crucial thing was that how many resources you can raise. It doesn't matter whether it comes in the form of taxes or the grants or, or loans. So both the center and the states were trying to maximize borrowing and that arrangement continued. A uh, lot of, um, uh, so that was the period practically, uh, which I would say genuine uh, in implementation of the constitutional arrangement. So letter and spirit was practically of the same time. Uh, by the late 60s, there was a realization that there is a lot of problems caused by especially this um, massive number of projects individually funded and customized uh, assistance to be provided. Then there was a massive change uh, in the system of providing assistance to the state. The, uh, the planning commission then uh, brought out what came up uh, as a new system of central assistance for a state's plan. More things, most things, individual projects were discontinued, funding of that. And we moved to a system where there was a block assistance and loan for the uh, for the state's needs. The states would make their plans and those plans would be funded practically by 70% loans and 30% grant, uh, which was formula driven, uh, the Gardgill formula. So, um, and al along with uh, this individual programs, which the center considered, uh, considered of importance were funded as centrally sponsored schemes. So centrally sponsored schemes acquired some presence uh, there was um, a kind of uh, uh, stated understanding that CSS, which is more individual uh, project oriented or individual program oriented, would not get big. Uh, so it was one sixth to be to be limited to one sixth of the total assistance of the states, and this uh, this program went on. By the way, in fifties, the, the question also arose because the, when the planning commission got created, that the finance commission which had jurisdiction over the entire um, uh, sort of finance of the central government and the states while deciding the resources to be transferred, the planning commission which took charge of the financing the plan um, and the question was literally settled and the finance commission accepted that the plan grants and the plan financing would be by, by, the, by the planning commission and that jurisdiction was in a way a little bit curtailed. Uh, so in 70s, we moved to this new system, that is where it worked, uh, but a, a very side uh, impact, uh, which was quite adverse in my judgment, is that the central government became literally the biggest financer of the states uh, in the form of the 70% loan. Another thing was also started, which was small savings loans, so small savings loan and the plan loans together in, in 70s and 80s, literally provided about 70-75% of the uh, plant resources to the states. So those changes were um, there. Uh, the ills of this kind of financing uh, was uh, responsible for states becoming very weak uh, financially. Um, uh, those days today are not remembered, but there were many treasuries which were closed for many days. Assam's treasury remained closed for more than 200 days. Uh, in 2003 because of the inability of the state to meet its commitment that way. And then in 2003 to 2005, a massive uh, restructuring of the actual relations were, uh, were carried out. In 2005, the government decided that uh, no longer the, the central government would provide loans to the states. The states would only raise the loans from the market. Um, so these were the fundamental changes which took place. 2017, the, um, the planning commission uh, was abolished 
and the Finance Commission got the jurisdiction for the entire finance again. And recently, there have been some changes again, which uh, uh, makes the central government have much greater so say. So in, 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 in letter constitution, there's been no change, but we have seen phases where true implementation of the federal federalism, then central government getting very powerful, states getting indebted uh, heavily towards the center, and then that being corrected and states being sort of restored their fiscal space, and finally, again, some. So there is a very interesting uh, the from cooperative federalism to uh, very heavily centralized federalism to then true central uh, true federalism again. And in recently, again, moving towards some order of uh, uh, the federal union, uh, the, the the central unionism. So you try to say that. Uh... There were two windows, two major windows through which the intergovernmental fiscal transfer took, you know, it took place. One was the finance commissions, what, what you call the revenue transfers. At that time, it used to be called a non-plan transfers. And second was the planning commissions for the capital, the transfer for the capital purposes, which they used to call it a plan transfer. This was the terminologies uh, used here in India. By Which the way, Alok, uh, plan also had a lot of revenue component. Absolutely. In fact, Absolutely. that was the reason why the plans got literally undone later on because the revenue component kept rising. Absolutely. Absolutely. So now it is entirely by the finance commissions. And I think as you rightly said in 2004 and five, after the report of the 12th finance commission, uh, which was constituted during Mr. Vajpayee's time, Atal Bihari Vajpayee's time. Right. And the reform took place thereafter. So that was that was the case. So we have gone from ups and downs. Now, many states and many scholars, they have been arguing that this fiscal policy, the autonomy at the state level has been eroded considerably over a period of time. And uh, there are some instances, some very major glaring instances under which this fiscal autonomy of the states, it has been eroded. If you can just uh, share one or two, since you have worked at the states also for a number of years. I think the biggest uh, reason responsible for uh, sort of um, denting in the state's fiscal autonomy is the way the, uh, the borrowing powers uh, have, have worked. You remember this, the Article 293.3 um, uh, the, uh, provides that uh, the states will have to take the central government's consent uh, for the borrowing program if they are indebted to the, to the center. And since, as I described earlier, um, uh, in the first 50 years, there was tremendous indebtedness, which uh, the states got, got subjected to, to, the, to the center then these states had no f uh, fiscal autonomy literally to plan its, um, its, its borrowing resources. Uh, that was the reason why in 2005, uh, the decision that no more the central government would uh, sort of take um, uh, or would be required uh, to provide loans to that. Now, um, again on the same field, recently in last couple of years, if you see the uh, tendency of the government while giving the permission for borrowing, uh, the number of conditions being laid these days. And uh, the half a percent is only for power or this half percent is for if you do these kind of reforms, etc. In a way, the working of the, um, the, the loans or the borrowing arrangements have, I think, dented or affected the fiscal federalism. The second instance which I would uh, quote to you is the way the Article 282 uh, has worked, um, where uh, the, it was intended to be an exceptional kind of arrangement. Uh, you use it in exceptional situation where the central government can provide grants to the state for the state subject. But this got over the years um, uh, and it has now evolved into a massive system of centrally sponsored schemes. Literally half the ministries of the government of India today uh, work on the state subject, subjects, agriculture, health, and um, many other uh, uh, ministries which are there 
the cooperation industry in many of them, the uh, education kind of thing. And uh, the, uh, the state's fiscal autonomy in this space has been severely constrained by the fact that, um, uh, let's take any, uh, for example, education. So all these education expenditure, other than the teacher salaries, et cetera, which they pay, uh, all the programmatic expenditure has got subjected to the central government schemes. Uh, how much would be the state's contribution, what would be the unit cost, and how uh, the expenditure would be provided for, what would be, uh, would it be spent on, and things like that. I think the evolution and the uh, gargantuan system of CSS, which we have created, is the other instance where the constitutional working has. And maybe if I can give the last one, which um, uh, the, the way the GST system was designed and has worked has, has also impacted. So there are a number of uh, important ways in which um, the, the, the uh, character of fiscal federal relations in the country has undergone. Eroded the fiscal autonomy of the state. Even the seventh schedule was changed. The seventh schedule, which contains the union list, the state list, and the concurrent list, I think since 1950, there was a lot of changes that have taken place in the seventh schedule itself. Don't you think this need to have a relook at uh, these changes uh, once again? Correct. So I think uh, there are certain basic flaws in the seventh schedule. Number one, the seventh schedule was constructed for the situation which existed in 1940s. Right. So things which were not there at that point of time were just not, they're just not there. And things which were important at that time are no longer important or not, not there. So that is one reason. Second, um, the, uh, the basic construct about sharing the revenue or taxation powers was that, that you, um, you would cleanly divide that this tax is within the central government space and this tax is for the state space. But the way uh, the world works today with, in an integrated manner and all, you realize that actually the taxes the, 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 uh, cannot work in this particular fashion. The way the, the GST later on had to be brought for uh, subsuming the central excise duties and customs and the state's uh, sales tax and, and, and many other taxes uh, tells you that the taxation power perhaps need to be uh, worked uh, differently. And the third thing which I think um, uh, uh, in, in our uh, anxiety to make this clean division, not only on taxation subject, but other subjects as well, um, uh, it's, it's not in practice, it's impossible to neatly divide the functional jurisdiction. Take anything, for example, agriculture, which is a classical, or for, for that matter, land, which is a classical local uh, kind of thing, which should be in the states, and it is in the states. But there are national policy issues connected with agriculture, uh, uh, national issues which are um, uh, connected with that. And if you say that exclusively the states would work on agriculture and the center would not work, it wouldn't work. Likewise, if you take, for example, roads, now there are national highways which cannot be in the jurisdiction of any state alone, or then there are state highways and there are local highways, so to say. So I think what the, um, the change which in my judgment is needed is to reconstruct the, uh, the seventh schedule in a manner that the national and international uh, responsibilities relating to uh, most subjects, uh, which cannot be exclusively put into the, uh, are kept in the, uh, in the central domain and those which are state uh, or which, which uh, remain state oriented are sort of put into the state's domain. And we also have a local list, which we don't have today. That local list, which we have the, um, for the panchayats and all is actually no independent list. Uh, and therefore the local authorities don't have. Uh, so I think if we can reconstruct, but it's not an easy thing to do. Absolutely. We can take some questions uh, from the participants. There was one question is that as per the Finance Commission's uh, recommendations, the union divisible pool has been increased. That is in fact in 42, 41% uh, from 32%. 
but centers tax collections uh, program uh, they said the cess and surcharges you continue to collect which is actually not shared with the state which is actually a very very important point yes uh, uh, after the 10 finance commissions the the divisible pool was not considered as a gross revenue but a net revenue and the cess and surcharges have been kept outside the divisible pool so what is your take on this see the cesses were intended to be exceptional and uh, once in a kind of thing not a usual arrangement for financing certain very desirable specific activities right for example if you want to promote textile or you want to promote environment or you want to control the uh, the carbon so you design a specific cess for that specific purpose and use it for that uh, so that was the purpose of cess the surcharges were again meant for meeting temporary requirements if there is a war you need more finance and therefore you can put some surcharge right and that is the reason why um, they were kept out of the divisible pool because these responsibilities were supposed to be national responsibilities and temporary and specific responsibilities and that is why uh, so in theory i would entirely agree with the construct in the constitution that cesses should be there the surcharges should be there but what is not uh, correct and what is is that the cesses have become now main method of collecting tax for example look at the excise duties today the excise duty on petroleum products uh what the central government collects 80% 85% is in the form of cess and only 10 to 12% is in the form of duty tax shareable tax likewise um, there are so many cesses education cess was there higher education cess social health um, uh, the, yeah yeah and now agriculture development cess, so many cesses and these are now raised as a principal mode of raising taxes which the government does not want to share with the states and this becomes a general pool that is no it doesn't become a general pool it becomes a central government pool absolutely central government right. general pool that's correct so um, uh, and uh, this when we talk about this 42% or something look at the data for last two years or three years the effective um, share of uh, the states in central taxes has become less than 30% absolutely. So, absolutely so 42% is nowhere excise is such a and now that's happening on the uh, the custom side um, and that is something to my mind it was not the intention behind cesses and surcharges uh, and if we can't really uh, behave responsibly and use these cesses and surcharges exceptionally for the exceptional purposes then it makes sense that you don't have this kind of wild power and these are either abolished or these are made shareable that is the way we need to proceed for there is another question here this is related to political economy mm -hmm. you have worked under the coalition government you have also worked under the majority government so the question here is which is very obvious does it impact impact the fiscal architecture all right if the question is that the character of the government whether it's a coalition or it's a majority government does it uh, impact the fiscal architecture if that is the question i think uh, uh, there is there are i don't think there are any studies to the, to, to that effect Uh, which prove con conclusively but based on the uh, evidence of what broad terms uh, and um, the coalition governments tended to be little more sort of oriented towards taking care of the state's interest whereas the uh, majority government tends to be little more central oriented right but it's not necessary that this has to be uh, as i uh, uh, the vajpayee government in 2003 5 uh, was was also a coalition in a way but it was 
uh, led by a majority uh, uh, power uh, and it was responsible for virtually reversing the fiscal federalism trend and give back the power to the states. Um, uh, but if you look at the recent evidence, which um, is a majority government, certainly it has uh, sort of uh, exhibited much more centralized or centralist tendencies. That's right. I think there in the past, uh, uh, some people say that Chandra Babu Naidu used to uh, uh, pressurize uh, the union government because it was that was a regional party supporting right. the national government there. Uh, right. at, the center. There is another question uh, that's about the pandemic. This whether the pandemic has impacted the the fiscal federal architecture of the country last two years or so. So pandemic, uh, one way it uh, Im immensely affected the the tax collection of the center of the states for 2021 in the first quarter. There was a massive de devastation um, of the financial uh, uh, arrangements and the ability of the states and the center to raise uh, revenue. So that is one kind of impact which pandemic had. The other one, which I think um, uh, its implications would probably be realized as we go along um, uh, uh, in times to come, this uh, National Disaster um, uh, Management Act, the NDMA, uh, actually has uh, very serious implications for the fiscal federal arrangement in the country. Uh, the uh, NDMA empowers literally the central government uh, to virtually take over the fiscal side of the, uh, of the state. It can direct what to do, what not to do, what expenditures to be incurred. And uh, that is where even a vaccine strategy or uh, transfer of assistance from the uh, central government to the states. Even otherwise, the CSS were, uh, when they, they provided the, the big handle to the central government, but NDMA provisions, uh, I think, strengthened um, substantially. So if you say, using the NDMA power that you have to shut your industry, you have to shut your um, transport, or you have to keep your people uh, away from employment in your homes, uh, all for their safety and uh, that, that, that's understandable, but fiscal implications are quite severe. Now, we come to the finance commissions. This finance commissions of India, it can be compared with the Commonwealth Grant Commission of Australia. It can also be compared with the Fiscal and Financial Commission of South Africa. Now, there is a difference that in India, the terms of reference of the finance commission, including the membership, is unilaterally decided by the central government or the government of India without a consideration, without a consultations with the state government. And there was a lot of hue and cry, which is not the case there in the Commonwealth Grant Commissions or the South African uh, Fiscal Financial Commissions. Even the membership also come from the local governments in both the countries. So what do you say? Can we continue with this kind of practice? Uh, so while uh, 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 it, it, I think it can have no, no two opinions that it's desirable, to consult the states. And it is also desirable to have some members nominated or uh, appointed in consultation with the states. But I uh, have very, uh, uh, I mean, that's my considered opinion that in practice, this is impossible to be done in the country. Uh, um, uh, number one, we have so many states and with so many, uh, um, uh, 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 states being ruled by different political parties, etc. If you start a consultation on the terms of reference or the membership, this consultation will never be over. Uh, if you want to do a genuine consultation, if you have to do a formality uh, uh, of inviting the state's view, that already happens. So every time it's written to the states, states do send something. Um, and uh, the central government uh, dutifully uh, ignores them. 
may not even look at them right so uh, in practice i don't think this is workable by the way the uh, the majority of the finance commission terms and conditions which are effective which makes uh, which are constitutionally mandatory that sharing of taxes and some of the grants in um, support of the uh, gaps in the revenue or the local bodies and all so uh, those are constitutionally determined these these are repeated uh, uh, exactly in the similar manner as it's stated in the constitution that last term uh, uh, of reference in the constitution that in the interest of sound finance is something which uh, is is used by the central government but uh, 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 and that is where the central government exercises some uh, sort of sometimes little um, uh, uh, intruding kind of terms of reference are, 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 are sent but if you take into account the way the finance commissions have responded to that set of uh, terms of reference i think finance commissions have showed immense maturity and impartiality in which they they have been responded and by the way those uh, most of those terms are not uh, uh, constitutionally necessary to be accepted and therefore in practice uh, i don't think this uh, authority or uh, exercised by the central government has really not done much damage i think our finance commissions have built a tremendous record of credibility and independent uh, independence and therefore i don't think there is any uh, need to uh, sort of build some uh, process of consultation which may only lead to delay absolutely now in the recent development the gst council is there in place the all state finance ministers they are member the union finance minister is also a member of the gst councils and they meet periodically and take the decisions it's like a, a fiscal arrangements committee there in, in in canada now mm -hmm. since since the gst councils is meeting frequently and the finance commission is there only once in 5 years and they cease to exist after they submit the report don't you think there is uh, there should be any formal institutional arrangements linking the gst councils with the union finance commissions see i don't see that necessity honestly um, the finance commission's job is episodic at a point of time every 5 year you take stock of the working of the uh, sharing arrangements and if there is any change needed to be done in that sharing arrangement you recommend that um, uh, finance commission is not uh, a monitoring body or a fiscal body uh, uh in fact in my judgment the time which we give to the finance commissions this two to and half years every time is excessive the finance commission should be asked to do their job in 6 months to 1 year uh, and uh, uh, make their recommendations on the specific terms of reference and done with it this is the only real job which is required that based on the working and changes in the economy or tax collections etc is there a need for changing the formula of division from 40% 42% or to something or there is some need to give some sort of grants for that that job i don't think requires it to be a permanent one and if that is not the case uh, for a permanent kind of thing the relationship with the gst council uh, does not arise so the finance commission should take stock of the way the gst council said uh, council have worked and have shaped up the uh, the uh, working of the gst system in the country that should suffice so in my judgment there is neither a need for the finance commissions to be permanent or um, uh, uh, to have any sort of working relationship with the gst council okay now coming to the third year of governments generally the third year they collect just about 5% of the total expenditure requirements and rely too much on the intergovernmental transfer system both from the states as well as from the union government how can we address uh, the fiscal needs uh, of this third tier uh, or that is that is local government both panchayats in the rural areas and the municipalities in the urban areas i am not talking about the uh, the municipal corporation in big cities but these small 
municipalities and panchayats i think uh, uh, alok in my judgment we will have to give a very strong stable and meaningful character uh, to the local bodies first before we uh, uh, decide what is the best mechanism for uh, entrusting the fiscal pass what i mean is that in practice these small panchayats um, somewhere 1000 people somewhere 3000 people the very uh, and some maybe all average is i think 5 to 6000 people per panchayat these are too small an entity to be fiscally uh, uh, to be to be a fiscal institution in the country right uh, for last 50 years we are running this endless um, debate about transferring functions functionaries and finance etc Uh, nothing really has happened these are very small entities which are actually used for doing some work implementation to my mind uh, we will need to sort of raise the basic unit of 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 the local bodies in the urban areas we have clear uh, we have municipalities but for the rural areas something like block level is an appropriate level for the panchayat uh, uh, system to to work we should abolish the lower levels we should convert them into some wards etc of the pan panchayat at the block level that would become a, a reasonably strong entity uh, maybe about 2 lakhs to 2 and 1/2 lakh people per per panchayat samiti uh, or per block and once you do this strong entities uh, creation and then the second thing which is required to be done is to entrust them as states are in, interested independently the authority or such a certain subjects it may not be a very wide one um, you can decide on education local sanitation or um, uh, things like that uh, which uh, need to be given to the or property management uh, and then you can also give the specific um, uh, 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 land uh, agriculture a specific uh, authority or property tax collections or land tax and things like that so i think what is needed is to create a strong third tier not third fourth and fifth tier then entrust them with specific authorities as independently as uh, the states and center have and then entrust them with the fiscal authorities uh, i think if we do that then we will have a strong third tier otherwise this what is going on for last 40 50 years will go on without really uh, the 30 year coming up as a very strong end now sugar there is a question i think which has emanated from the title of your book which is there uh, does the ambition of india becoming a 5 trillion economy of a 10 trillion economy dollar 10 trillion dollar economy has a negative or a positive federal implications in fiscal architecture so that's the question oh, uh, uh, thank you very much for somebody asking about the the book um, so um, the uh, uh, the fiscal architecture in my judgment uh, will need to be uh, redefined on the terms which we discussed in the talk today but everyone would need to be participating unless we create the third tier as a strong local Uh, institutions especially by organizing the rural areas into strong entities and leave the states as um, uh, as semi sovereign if not sovereign in their own space i think we will not get the best results a over dominating center uh, trying to do everything from delhi is not what will lead to a 5 trillion or 10 trillion dollar economy uh, we can i can explain this but in 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 view of the shortage of time but in short let me say that unless uh, we also reorganize the uh, we'll have to change the loan arrangements we will have to change the taxation arrangements and create these strong fiscal entities with independent power and also the independent resources with the balance of the resources being decided by the uh, by the independent finance commissions whether these are state or um, or the central i think the dream of 5 trillion to 10 trillion would be little bit adverse effect uh we can take one more questions if you allow 
That's yeah, so about last time. Union budget. That's about the union budget. Yeah. In this union budget, which has come actually from the participants, in the union budget 2022-23, 1 trillion rupees have been allocated to the states over and above the normal transfers for capital purposes, which uh, is a good thing, uh, many people say. How do you see this kind of things? This is going to whether the state would be able to spend this money for capital purposes and whether this will go... Uh, Further, how 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 do you see this? I see this as a uh, as a very fundamental damaging kind of development. This was started two years back in the name of uh, assisting during the pandemic. Now, what it does is that uh, one lakh crore um, or one trillion uh, rupees is not a very large sum for the states. The states budget is about 45 or 44 uh, trillion dollars. And the borrowings are also about um, going to be in this year about 12 to 13 trillion dollars. So one trillion is not a great sum of money in that way. But what it will do is that uh, it will make the states, number one, spend this money on what uh, projects the central government wants, the Gati Shakti and other things. It will not be the state's own choice of projects. Second thing what it does is that it makes the states indebted to the center for the next 50 years. And their independence, their, uh, uh, their autonomy in the fiscal space would be, uh, would be hugely compromised. And what uh, had to be done in 2005, this is actually a reversal of that policy. So I don't actually support this at all. Um, whoever I need to advise, I simply say that central government shouldn't start any, anything like this and the state should not accept it. Uh, let's, uh, there's no question of whether the states would be able to spend or not. They spend $45 trillion. What's $1 trillion into it? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gurk, for uh, sharing your insights uh, uh, with, with us, with the participants, with the Forum of Federations. Many of the responses were very, very bold uh, that you have been writing uh, continuously on this. And uh, this government have actually made a number of changes which have actually changed the fiscal architecture of the country. Many more are going to come. GST Council is a very, very big change. The change of uh, the centrally sponsored scheme with umbrella kind of organizations, the, 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 the borrowing. And so there are many changes that have taken place uh, in this government and we can expect many more because this government seems to be very, very decisive. So thank you very much for this, uh, for the sessions, for responding to all difficult questions that has come from the audience. And uh, so with this, uh, uh, I, I, uh, Alok is signing off from uh, this webinar on changing the fiscal architecture of India. Thank you, Alok. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone participating in this call. Thank you very much.